You're listening to the Gold Standard Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympian and motivational speaker, Leah Amico. On this show, we're going to dig deep to unlock what it actually takes to build a foundation for greatness. If you're an ambitious person with big vision, but you feel like fear is holding you back, get ready for some major breakthroughs. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Gold Standard Podcast. Today's guest is a former league, major league baseball relief pitcher who played with the Houston Astros, the San Diego Padres, and the San Francisco Giants. And he was also promoted to their Boston Red Sox, Tommy's favorite team, of course, my husband's favorite team, in 2004 when they won the World Series. So welcome to the Gold Standard Podcast, Brandon Puffer. Thank you, Leah. I'm so happy to be here. It's an honor. I know my thing's a little glitchy, but we'll try to work through that. That's right. The biggest thing is people can hear your story. I think more people listen than watch, but we want to get both. Um, I want to talk first and foremost, let's go back to young Brandon as an athlete, as a kid. Tell me where you grew up and kind of what you were like as a, as a young boy. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Mission Viejo, California, which is in Orange County, Southern. I know you're familiar, but not everybody is. I, I grew up there, very fortunate to grow up there. Just, you know, great weather, all, you know, beaches everywhere. And um, it, it was awesome. And I, I really took to baseball probably around seven years old. My dad coached and, and we ended up getting very involved in the North Michigan Little League there. And um, it just became a, a passion of mine. And like a lot of folks, I know like you as a little one, I had that dream of becoming a major league baseball player. And so um, just young Brandon didn't know, just kind of naive, but had maybe a little bit of talent and, um, you know, just had a lot of lessons to learn, but knew I had a passion for the game, a love for the game. It brought my whole family together every weekend and most weeknights. And so just a, an, an affinity for that in general, just a thing that we can rally around as a family. So you were a pitcher right from the get-go, or did you find out that you had that talent? How did that happen? Um, yeah, so like most people, when I was young, I, I pitched, played played different positions. I could hit a little bit and stuff like that. So I didn't know that it was going to be pitcher until probably late into high school. Um, so all through Little League and stuff like that, I enjoy, still enjoyed hitting and doing things like that. And um, But yeah, I just think, you know, probably around... 12 years old, 11, 12 years old, I, I kind of hit that early growth spurt, you know, the guys who's a little taller than everybody else, a little more mature and threw a little harder. And that's where pitching really started to be um, where I probably showed the most promise, I'd say. And then um, again, just in high school, trying to help the team any way I could, if it was hitting, playing first base, but probably kind of more, more into um, as scouts came around and started giving, you know, advice and things of that nature, that pitching would probably be the way for me. That's awesome. So in that sense, because I know I was actually a pitcher also until my sophomore year of college, and I know the mentality that goes with that. So at a young age, would you say that you had the right type of mentality that would be that athlete that kind of would take you to the next level? Was it work ethic that set you apart? Was it all of it? What would you say? Yeah, I would say in terms of the mindset early on, it, it was it was there just in terms of the very, very competitive nature of things, that one-on-one -on -one battle and wanting to be better, believing I was I was better than the guy standing in there against me, which is a mindset that we have to have at the higher level for sure. Um, the thing I lacked was um, control of my body language and uh, just, you know, I could throw fits and get so upset and so uber competitive that it, it wasn't fun for me or anyone around me if I was not succeeding. And so that's what I really try to pour into the kids I coach now. And I always tell them like, I'm not telling you this because I was great at it. I'm telling you this because I wish I had someone hold me accountable for this when I was younger. So um, yeah, I had a good mindset uh, competitively, but I had to really learn um, along the way on how to handle failure. So you talked about you know, holding people accountable. You said, I wish I had somebody, were you able to kind of get away with it because you were successful? So in a sense, you kind of like, oh, he does well. So we're just going to kind of let him be him. I think so. I really do. And I think a part of it was too, I just lacked so much self-control in that area that folks tried. And I mean, certainly encouraged me to, to get a hold of that. And, um, but at the end of the day, I was pretty strong willed and um, I really had to come to that realization for myself, honestly. And so um, it, it would I mean, honestly, all the way through my professional career, I had to struggle with that. And as you know, there's a lot of failure involved. And um, I just had to try to figure out and, and 
didn't always succeed at it, even towards the very end, how to, I just never wanted to let my teammates down. Um, I always felt like I did when I didn't have a good outing. And um, so, yeah, it was just a constant struggle to try to figure that out. And it's helped me really as a coach on this end. So what's the biggest thing that you have seen as a coach passing along the information that actually leads to athletes getting it and figuring it out and being able to actually have those controlled emotions? Is there something specific? You know, as you say that, I'm thinking about it. And I think it's the important, I had this, I was in this situation last night at practice with some kids around 14. And uh, it was, I think it's important to love on them and show them why it's important rather than just, Hey, you know, in my case, I could say this now about myself and that you're kind of making a fool of yourself and your whole family when you act like that. It's not that it's, Hey, I love you. And the reason I want to help you get control of this is because you want to be a college baseball player, maybe even professional at some point. And some of these things are going to set you apart when you're getting recruited and it's really close and physically everything's lining up. You're, you're neck and neck with another young man. They're going to go to that. They're going to go to the intangibles, the makeup, the how you handle failure. Um, so I really try to tweak that. And I, I didn't understand this when I was young because I wasn't in that travel ball space and all the recruiting and all that is different. And so I just really try to, and it's true, I, it's, guys, it's not for me. It's for you to try to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And I think then they go, oh, okay, yeah, if this is going to stand in the way of, um, you know, me, me going to the next level, then I better take this seriously. And then also giving them the skills, right? Like not just, hey, shape up, but like, hey, let's control your breathing. Let's do some deep breathing. Let's get a positive self-talk going that can kind of reset your negative thoughts. Um, Because I just didn't have the mental skills. It was like, yeah, I know mental game is important, but I don't know how to do that. So trying to give them the skills and not just say, hey, you need to change this and figure it out. I think practicing that positive self-talk, it's not only a skill we need in sports and we need to learn young. It's something we need to apply to us the rest of our lives. I mean, I feel like that, when I look at times where I struggled and other times where I go through after going through something hard and I respond, okay, it really comes down to talking to myself, prayer, you know, where I'm turning for me, you know, my, the Bible, we'll get a little bit into that with you as well. Cause I know your faith is important to you, but I do remember when you say that, I do remember being in high school and I was, you know, a highly, a highly, um, decorated athlete throughout those years, won a couple national championships heading into college and, and the recruitment. I didn't get recruited by that very many colleges at all, but I had a lot of success, but I still had a coach who had played at the collegiate level. And she told me coaches are watching to see what you do after you fail that failure recovery. It's so important to this day. And even with your, like you're saying with so much information out there and so many more books and videos and everything they can see, it's still something that it comes down to like having that self-control. So I, I like that you shared that. All right. Take me into um, how you got drafted and your emotions through that entire experience. Yeah, of course. So um, I got drafted my senior year out of high school. Um, again, everything was so different. So social media, all those things weren't there. I knew scouts were around. They'd been in the home a little bit and I was hopeful, but again, you just, you weren't sure, you know, it wasn't rankings or anything like that. So Uh, ironically in California, the school went a little longer into the summer than some areas. And so I was still in high school when the draft happened and it was pretty cool because they, they drafted me and they got word to me by announcing it over the intercom at the high school. It was like, Hey, congratulations. You know, Brandon Parker got drafted by the Minnesota twins. Yada, yada. And so that was a cool moment. And that was kind of like surreal and wow, maybe this is it. You know, this is what I've been dreaming about all my life. And, um, you know, I would love to say that it offered that huge peace and joy that I thought it would, but then it was just like, okay, what's next? And for me, what was next was I actually said, uh, Hey, I, you know, I still have a few days left to graduate. I signed and rookie ball had already started out in Florida, but I was like, well, obviously I need to graduate. Just kind of go to my graduation and grad night. Of course. I said, how about that senior trip that everyone's planning? They said, absolutely not. (laughs) The day after you graduate, we own you and you're coming out to Florida. So uh, yeah, it was a wild ride to graduate on the West Coast and pretty much the next day fly out to Fort Myers, Florida for my first spring training. 
And that's a lot at that age yeah. to just all of a sudden be gone. And I know what you mean about those sacrifices. I, same thing, had to miss so many different things. Senior day at Disneyland to go play an all-star game and just, you know, grad night cut short to go up to a tournament. Same, same idea. Um, but it's like you make those sacrifices because there's something bigger that you're working toward and what you're going to get out of it is even better. But it's a reminder, those that are willing to make those sacrifices, like, again, like those are the ones that know the process they know the goal, they stick to it and they're willing. Uh, tell me a little bit about when you got then to into that, you know, into camp with everybody else. And, and I know you said, you know, you went, you went out there. Like I think about when I went to college at university of Arizona, I was successful in high school, but then I was like, Whoa, can't do I have what it takes at this level? Did you ever have that moment of doubt at all? I did. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I showed up at rookie ball again, uh, just a young buck out of California. Now, fortunately, and I think the same applies to you, I grew up in an area where there was a lot of good athletes. So uh, I wasn't from like a small town, middle of nowhere where I was the only guy ever. Um, but that being said, you show up and it's like, man, all these guys were the guy where they grew up and not just in the States, but Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Puerto Rico. And um, so, yeah, I remember I, I, I got there in the middle of a game. Uh, in my street clothes. And I just walked up to the dugout to take a look and meet everybody. And I was like, wow, this is pretty high quality uh, baseball. So that mental game becomes very important, right? So it's like, I can only control so much. And I didn't really know that the first year. Well, I didn't know that at all the first year. I learned that later when they would post rosters in spring training and there's 15 too many guys on every roster and they got to get rid of so many. And it's like, I'm on this rookie ball roster and there's four more to go that are way overcrowded how do I get to there? You know? And, and what I realized is not by focusing on that, but just being the best version of myself every day. And that, that was a long journey. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the minor leagues and, and got released several times and had failure to kind of like, I got to figure this thing out. And, um, but yeah, that, I definitely had that same thought of, wow, I'm, I'm in here with the big boys now. So I got to kind of strap it on and figure out how I'm going to set myself apart. How did you set yourself apart? Eventually, how I set myself apart was by being um, just taking on the, the mental game really strong. I started diving into books. Um, I started um, just really taking those practices into, into my own life. And it, it didn't happen right away. I had probably five or six years in the minor leagues, just toiling around a ball, um, just really just insecure, but covering it up with being overly confident and cocky when I got out there and, you know, those kind of things, but just insecurity was such a big thing. And, and so, you know, I did okay. I did okay. My first few years wasn't taking care of myself off the field. I know we'll parallel the stories, but addiction was a part of my life and even backing up to my childhood, my dad struggled with that. And, and so, you know, there's just all these different things. Actually, when I got to the field, I was in my happy place. And I know, you know, this, I was confident. I was, um, you know, felt good about what I was doing. It was all the downtime trying to manage my life off the field is where I really struggled. And so again, um, but fast forwarding about five or six years, setting myself apart when I did, you know, give my life to the Lord, when I did start taking care of myself and realizing how important it was to, to stay in and get rest and that's when I set myself apart. And I only did it because God came in my life. He flipped it upside down and he said, okay, these aren't the things that we're going to do anymore. And I said, yeah, that's right. So once I was sober, which came with faith being important, my career really took off on a trajectory that was pretty fast. And um, to, to fast forward even a little more, and I know I'm bouncing around. Once I went through a very serious moment in my life and my faith was tested and I didn't handle it very well. And it was, I found out it was a little more surface level than I thought. I thought I was surrendered. I thought I was, I was sober. I was doing what Christians are supposed to do. But um, my, now my faith got tested and I, and I didn't handle it very well. And the same thing, if we had a graph right now, my career just went right down because I was back into making poor choices and not taking care of myself. And honestly, just not honoring the gift that God gave me. Wow. Yeah, we, I do want to get a little bit more into that also. But I want to ask you first. You talk about, again, the choices, right? And kind of the identity. I, I think this is so common. You hear this so many times. And I was so thankful in college, I feel like. And it was through faith. And it was through getting grounded in what my identity was and who God said I was. 
Um, that helps you. It helps you make choices. It helps you kind of find that right crowd that's going to lead you in that right direction, as well as, you know, all the good things in your own individual personal life. Did you see any examples, whether through coaches, whether through teammates, did you see those people at that time? And was it something that you just hadn't necessarily connected with those people or you didn't know what they were really doing? Like, what did you see any of that or is it just not very common? You see some of it for sure. It wasn't really common for me. What really led to my faith is it started back in my family. So we talked about my dad. Um, my mom has been just a warrior, prayer warrior, woman of faith forever, as long as I've known her. And she's a pastor. She's at a huge church out in California. She does pastoral care. So her whole life is service, period. Like that's all she's ever known or done. And ironically, I kind of resented it. I was like, oh, I don't, she's just, that's the only way I've ever known her. It's like, it's not real life. She doesn't know my struggles, my battles. I wanted to be like my dad, who was a big, tough, strong guy who liked to drink and all those kind of fight and all those kind of things. And I was like, yeah, that's a man. That's who I want to be with, be like. And so, but my dad went to celebrate recovery, got sober, gave his life to the Lord. And now I'm like, wait a minute. So my mom was just this freak who just grew up this way. My dad literally just saw life change in my dad. And so that's when it pricked me. I wish I would have got it then, but that's when I was like, wait a minute, I'm kind of paying attention here. And then in 1998, I came back for the off season. We always went to church. My mom worked at Salback Church and we, we made sure we went because mom wanted us to go. So I went to an adult group and that's where uh, God really got a hold of me for the first time. I always share with people um, the song, I Stand in Awe of You was a song where like it would be on every Thursday night at that young adult group. And then I would just kind of blow it off and folks would jump up and stand up when the chorus line hit and said, I stand in awe of you. And I would just be like, Oh, this is weird. And then that night, that very song, I got up, the Holy spirit got a hold of me. And it was like, yes, I'm going all in. And so from that point forward in uh, 1998, I was walking with the Lord. I was sober for about five years until, you know, things kind of went there. And then to your point, back to your original question, once I, became a Christian one, then I noticed like, who are the guys that are seeking God? Okay. There are guys on every team that are doing it. It's just, I wasn't so aware of it because I was in that other group where I didn't really want to be held accountable. I didn't really, I mean, I knew what was right and what I was doing is wrong. So of course you isolate and don't really want to be around those people that are doing it the right way. Yeah. I just find it so interesting. I think, you know, same thing, like people that are super famous and people who, you know, Justin Bieber, right. For example, like I know someone who knew him right in the beginning of his career and was in his first video with them before he really got crazy big and just, you know, came from a solid family, but you've just followed what happened to him and the things. And, and it's almost like, we're just not meant to like, like we want to achieve these high things. I think that is place inside of us, but sometimes like people aren't supposed to worship us. And in a sense, sometimes we get into these positions, you know, high role models, major league baseball, NFL, you know, famous actors, actresses or singers, you know, and, and then it's almost like they, they're trying to figure out, wait, who am I? Cause I'm over here. I'm this baseball player, right. For you, for me, I'm a softball player for him. I, you know, I sing and, but then it's like, but who am I as a person, right? That identity piece. And so, you know, I want to, I do want to talk a little bit about that. Part of the gold standard is the overcoming obstacles piece and challenges. And so I do want to go, you've alluded a little bit to going through kind of making not great choices. Will you share a little bit more about that and kind of what it took to finally get yourself and your heart on the right track and the right path? Yes, absolutely. I will. And so, like I alluded to earlier, I had faith in my life. I, I, I grew up with a, a prayer war for a mom, so she never stopped. And um, but yeah, I mean, we've got to make our own decision. This this spiritual journey is our own, you know. And so, um, I just had that battle all the time of knowing what I want, you know, what I want was right and what I wanted to do, and just not doing it, like Paul says in the Bible. And so, um, it was a constant struggle. And if I wasn't very intentional about my routine. Not, not, you know, we're routine people as athletes, but my routine for my soul and spiritually, it doesn't take very long to this day to really kind of start having thoughts again of, you know, you know the compromise and stuff like that. So, um, again, in 2004, I was sober from 1998 to 2004 in spring training with San Diego Padres, been in the big leagues just a little bit, so having a little bit of success or so you think. And um, I, I got separated from my first wife. And so 
I wasn't accountable to anybody. I wasn't like, I got to do this to be a good family guy. And the enemy just really started planting seeds. He just took that opportunity to go, you know what? You're, you're, you've been five years sober. You're more mature now. I bet you could handle it now. And, you know, let's hang out with the guys. Quit being the guy who never goes out with the guys. And, you know, so I just, all these different things, you know how the enemy works on us. And so um, one night I was in spring training, pure Arizona, and I walked by a jacuzzi and folks were having some beers in there. And I was like, you know what? Yeah. And I went and bought a little six pack, did my thing and nothing happened. Okay. I think maybe I do have this now. Well, the hook, line and sinker, uh, the next night it was like, well, the guys are going to hang out down the street. You could, you won't drive or anything. Let's go do that. And I just hit that slippery slope so fast in 2004. So, so fast. And, um, you know, that's, that was, once I opened that door back up, that was a battle from that point on. And I continued to play, you know, right. That year was actually a year I was in the big leagues of San Diego, close to home. I, you alluded to the Boston Red Sox thing. I, you know, I, I got a ring out of that deal. Just kind of like, again, you're trying to fill this hole with all these things that you think are going to make you have peace and joy. And none of that did it, you know, being in the big leagues, the world series ring, all these things, nothing worked um, because I was battling and struggling with my soul. Um, and um, basically what happened is in 2007 and eight, I took on a role with the Texas Rangers. That was kind of that bull Durham crash Davis role. And it was, um, you're the older guy, early thirties, that's been in the big leagues and you're going to go mentor these young studs, the, the Chris Davis and Derek Holland and Elvis Andrews who are all big names in baseball eventually that were like 19 years old, just starting their, their deal in double a. And so I loved it. I, I love that. I love encouraging people. I love being a mentor. Um, I went down, relished the role, um, in year two of that, um, they were kind of grooming me to be a coach. Um, man, the guys were just on me. They were like, Hey, Oh, come out with us. You know, we, we've heard you used to be a lot of fun. Let's go. And I remember telling these guys, Leo, I was like, guys, I, I can ruin my life in one night. Cause they would say, you know, when I would say, no, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that, man. It's not good for me. And they're like, Oh, it's one night. What's one night. And that's kind of a big part of my story. I share with kids like, it's just one choice, one compromise. And so fast forward, we're going through the season. I'm kind of like fending them off a little bit. Meanwhile, I'm the chapel leader of that team. I'm a mentor to them. But I'm still not walking the walk. Um, I'm still going out and kind of doing my own thing and maybe even living a double double life. But then I didn't want them to know that I was struggling because they looked up to me. And as a leader, I always share with people, it's like, look, doesn't mean you have it going on. Be vulnerable because I wasn't. And that could have helped me because they could have been like, oh, we, we get it now. And uh, I just basically on a Friday, September 13th, I was driving to the ballpark. I've been doing this for 15 years. And as you know, we're routine people. And I was driving in, got my food, same time every day. And I just go, you know what? Yeah. What, what's one night? I'll, I'll go hang out with the guys tonight. And uh, September 14th, I woke up that morning in an orange jumpsuit. And you can imagine where I was. And um, that led to a five-year prison sentence, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, which I never thought would have happened. I was like, never been in trouble. I've never, you know, like, what? One, one, one night, what happened? And sure enough, that was like, okay. And, and God said, you know, I always allude to Jonah and spending three days in the belly of the fish. And I was like, I think you need about three years because <laughs> you're a knucklehead. So I, I did. And when I went through a jury trial, very surreal, very intimidating. Um, and when they came out and sentenced me and I asked if I could say bye to my dad and they said, no. And they put me in handcuffs and they took me to a side cell and they, uh, took me of all my belongings and they put me in that cell when the bars closed. I can hear it to this day. I just looked up. I was doing the math on how old my children would be in five years. Um, cause I didn't know if I'd do five or three and a half or whatever. And obviously, um, you know, most people probably look at that and go, I didn't have to take that. And I don't know, honestly, but for me, that was, that was it. That was my rock bottom. And I know it's a pretty extreme one. And I just surrendered. I said, God, I don't know what you have for me from here, but this is where my choices got me. I've known right from wrong. You know, I, I'm accountable for this. I own this. And, um, basically where do we go from here? And, and Leah, every prayer to that point was like, just don't send me to jail. I'll be a good boy. You know, you know, those prayers, like I'll be good. And that one was different. That one was like, I'll walk through this as long as I need to. I'll do every day. I'll try to be a light in here. I'll encourage people. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. And so that's where that journey began, walking through prison and then getting out and humbly taking on some, some jobs and kind of like one step at a time, earning trust back and kind of earning my life back. So now it becomes a, a huge redemption story for what he's done on the other end of that. 
did it have what what was it was it when you went and got drunk and something happened is that what is that how that all transpired yeah i got so drunk i blacked out i don't remember it and what happened is i got a burglary habitation with intent to commit sexual assault and so just uh an awful thing it was kind of like late at night knock on the door of a friend i only knew one time put myself in a bad situation and um you know what they were they were like yeah we're not we're not we're not gonna just sweep this under the rug, you know, no athletes going to come in our town. And and the biggest part of that, you know, it ended up being, people always ask, would you change it? And I wouldn't because I wouldn't be the man I am today without walking through that. I would because I hurt so many other people. I hurt, you know, the victim that hurt her security was taken away and my family and her family. So all the collateral damage, if it's just you, it's like, ah, I just make my choice. No, it's, it's so much more than that. It's so many other people that are hurt in the process. I think that's an important piece to it. Like you saying and recognizing, right? Because so many people want to try to put themselves in that best light of like, okay, I figured it out, but they're not going to like acknowledge. And so that, that I think is a big deal. You, how many kids do you have, or did you have at this time? So at that time I had um, three kiddos and that, that is actually still what I have, but um, they were little, they were little at that time. Uh, my, my baby who's 14 now, uh, she's a freshman in high school was a baby and literally a baby at the time. So um, and that's just part of the redemption story. There was a time where I didn't get to speak to my two daughters for over a year and our relationship. Now, if you saw it, you'd be blown away. Mm-hmm. I mean, to the point where the little one, we'd get on a phone call like once a year and the little one would go, Morgan, Morgan, my, my older daughter would go, Hey, it's daddy. And she'd be like, that's not my daddy. That's your daddy. And I mean, talk about a crushing, heartbreaking thing to hear and then going, wow. But then you rebuilt everything. And God restored everything. It's amazing. And then I have an older son who's 27 now. He was in middle school at the time. I've had full custody of him since day one. So talk about the devastation for him. You know, dad's leaving and he stayed with my parents because I always had full custody of them. And they were just awesome and poured into him and loved on him. And um, we've all kind of drawn and learned from it. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's tough on some um, kiddos, you know? Yeah. You talk about that and you think of, like you said, like all the fallout, you make these decisions. And, and then again, I've heard that before, like you get to make the choice, but you don't get to pick the consequence. And like you said, like it almost comes crashing down, like, wait a second, how did we even get here? So, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful to hear not only the redemption piece, but that you're sharing that with other people. And, you know, I mean, with all of that, what, what is the biggest thing you wrote a book recently? recently. And now I know you're getting out and sharing. That's how we actually connected because our mutual connection, Dan Clauser had had you on his podcast and then he connected us and I'm so glad he did. Um, but your book is called from the bullpen to the state pen. Tell me a little bit about that and kind of what doors are opening up now that you've written your story. Yeah, no, that was one of those things that you know, when I was alone, eight by 10 cell, doing business with God and just really trying to be intentional about bettering myself, you know, going through cognitive intervention classes and reading books and getting in the word and just trying to just reboot everything. Because like you said, how did I get here? You know what I mean? And um, if someone would have said to me, hey, you know what? Go out with the guys one night and you're going to lose three and a half years of your freedom. You're not going to talk to your kids and hug your family and you're not going to have any choices. Who would do that? Like, no one's going to go, yeah, sign me up. That sounds great. But that's not how it happens. It's just like you make a choice. You don't realize what it's going to lead to. And then you, you don't choose the consequences to your point. So, yeah, so I was in there and I was just journaling and writing stuff down and just trying to, you know, where do we go from here, God? How do we not let this be in vain? Like, what are we going to do? And, and uh, the idea came to me, like, I, I think I'm led to write a book. And I had the title. I made that title up a long time ago, wrote it in my journal. But then, you know, just picked it up, put it down. Life got busy when I got back. Yeah, just all these different things. Um, But then, you know, as God would have it, he put some people in my path that led me through that and held me accountable for the process. And sure enough, we have it published now. So what that's done is, is A, just hopefully leaves a a legacy and a story for my family. And then B, it's, it's, it's been encouraging folks. And it's been an easier way to kind of get out there and maybe cast a little broader net. And it's opened up, you know, things like this and jumping on podcasts with, with people. And so I just make myself available is my big thing. If, if, if I'm asked to do just a little, little speaking engagement to two or three people here, or a big one or a huge pocket, whatever, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So that's always been my thing from that point forward. My prayer, you know, when I was away was, you know, just please use my story for good. I know you use all things for good. This doesn't seem like something that could be for good at this time. 
But sure enough, he's faithful and, and he's been using my, my story to encourage others. I'm really passionate about, you know, two groups of people. One, the ones that have the same struggles I had going, hey, you don't have to go down this path. You really, you really don't. Um, here, here's some other ways to avoid that. Or B, you know, uh, the second group is folks who already made a big mistake and they carry shame and guilt and all the things that come. And you can imagine when I just explained to you what I did, the shame and guilt that comes along with that. But just like, okay, how do we move forward from that? How do we push through that and understand that God still has a plan for you and you're still valuable um, because you don't feel like it a lot of times. And so those are the folks I'm trying to encourage with my story. Yeah, there's always there's always forgiveness. There's always redemption. You just got to turn to the right place for it. And God offers it to everyone. And I, I love that you are using it for good. And I know good will come out of it. And you are going to be able to impact those people who do feel worthless or like they're not worthy. Um, and they can't turn something around that as bad as either happened to them or what they've done. Um, so I, I do love how you share that. Tell me a little bit about what made you want to start? Um, you're the co-founder of the GPS Legends, where you coach baseball and mentor 17-year-old athletes. Tell me a little bit about what led to that and, and how that's going. Yeah, just another God thing. I mean, honestly, uh, I'll walk you through it. And you, you'll agree. I mean, there's nothing I could have imagined. Um, again, I was like, baseball is a passion of mine, but God, is anybody going to want me to be a part of baseball? You know, with this rap, you know, all these different things the enemy puts in your head, like, no, nah, you're not worthy of that anymore. And so what I did when I got out, uh, Reed Ryan, who's known Ryan's son, is the president, uh, him and Reese, his brother, um, great family, but entrepreneurs. I mean, they're into everything. And they own the AAA baseball team here in Round Rock. And I had played here, got to be friends with those guys and just, just wonderful people. Um, in fact, Nolan came as a character witness to my, to my trial. I mean, they just really stood by my side, which was super important. And, you know, Reed had written me and he had sent me a couple books and he said, hey, just look us up when you get out. We'll do anything we can do for you. And so obviously a big need is I need a job. I started over from scratch and didn't have anything left from the baseball career because I tried to stay out of jail. And I, had, I was taking care of my responsibilities while I was in there. So it's like, hey, uh, all right, come meet with us. And they said, hey, we have, um, you know, one thing available, but it's a uh, it's a maintenance job. And that's all we have. And I was like, well, I can't really fix anything, but I, I'm happy to have a job and be at a ballpark. And so I just spent a lot of time pressure washing, just manual labor around the stadium. Well, eventually I got asked to do a pitching lesson. It was just one pitching lesson. I said, really? They want to do it with me? Because I used to do a lot of that and I enjoy it. So I said, sure. And that went well. And that led to a couple more. And eventually the Express promoted me to be a baseball outreach coordinator for our community. And then it was like, okay, let's start a couple teams uh, through them. And so I did, and they kind of took off and they weren't really prepared to support that. They were just like, we don't know what this looks like, travel baseball. We've got a AAA team to worry about here. So myself and Brian Gordon, who founded GPS with me, uh, we just jumped out on a leap of faith. And we just said, you know what? The Express have a wonderful legacy and that's a great baseball family. But we just kind of feel led to go start our own and create our own legacy. And so that's what we did. And we're a few years in, started with one or two teams. And, you know, I think we have about 25, 26 right now. And um, from, from ages eight all the way up through uh, 18. And so it's just more kids and families to impact. Uh, baseball is the platform, but, um, you know, GPS, it, it started out as Gordon Puffer Select and morphed into God Provides Strength. And, um, you know, we just, our big thing is, hey, we're, none of us are perfect, but we're going to pray after every single practice and game and uh, faith's going to be a part of what we do. And um, so it's been great. I mean, just again, I, like, as you can see, nothing I could have conjured up or done on my own. It was just God going, okay, I'm going to just trust you, be faithful in this little humble job. And then I'm going to trust you with more and more and more. And so that's where we are now. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. What would you say to those high school athletes right now? Their dream is to make it to the big leagues. That's what they want. That's what they think everything's about. What, what would you say to them? Yeah, I get an opportunity to say a lot to them. And to, to them, what I would say is you have to be very, very consistent, very consistent, right? I mean, anyone, I always say like, uh, do a little, a lot, not a lot, a little, because anyone can get on that run where I'm going to hit it hard for a month and no one's going to outwork me. And that's got to go on for your whole career. I mean, it's just the most consistent people. Because like we alluded to earlier, there's a lot of talented folks, but who's going to work when they don't feel like it? Who's going to be the most consistent? And then right alongside of that is persistence because you're going to fail. And I, I really think it's a war of attrition. I think people just quit before it's their time. Honestly, they just, they can't handle the, the struggle or they can't handle the travel or the, 
being homesick or whatever the case may be. So it's like, if you really want to do this and it's what you want to do, know these struggles are coming. You're going to face these things. You're going to have to be very consistent. You're going to have to persevere through every bit of it. And then I think the follow-up to that is know who you are outside of the game. And we talked about that earlier. It's easy to get lost in I'm Leah, the softball player. I'm Brandon, the baseball player. And then, uh, so try to keep that perspective through that whole thing, because I know it got lost on me and I had to, had to really relearn it. Yeah, that's great advice. That's, it's awesome because I tell people the same thing. I say consistency and being reliable, like coach knows they can count on you, but you show up all the time as your best self and you might have down times, right? But you keep showing up anyways, right? And then you work through those. So I love that. And then the perseverance piece, absolutely. I, I found this interesting. I listened to Shay Hillenbrand this week speaking and sharing his story. And he made this comment multiple times. And he said, because he said it was one of the best at the top of the game. And he said, I had it all right. You talked about that. You think, okay, it's going to fill me up. And, and he talked a lot about that identity piece that he knew Shay as the athlete, but you're right. Shay as the person, no, like didn't deal with it, didn't know it. And he said, we sell our soul to the game. We sell our soul to the game. Did you see a lot of that in, in the MLB? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, from the standpoint of just, it's such a selfish pursuit and it, it kind of has to be, um, unfortunately, but there has to be a balance and I didn't balance it. Well, I knew guys that did. I ran into guys that seemed to have a really good family. So you do, because I mean, I don't know the statistics, but I can't imagine marriages in the MLB or really any professional sport for that matter, um, are, are set up to succeed. Um, cause you do, it's just constantly you. And, and here's the other thing, the mentality we talked about earlier, where I get between those lines and I'm better than you, I'm bulletproof. I'm, you can't beat me. You can't stop me, which you have to do. Then you get off the lines. You gotta be able to have that switch where you can turn that off and go home and just, you know, not, you, you think you're, you're God's gift to whatever, because that's the mindset you have to take out there. Even if you don't feel that way, you kind of have to trick your mind to go, and you know this from the level you played, like you're not going to beat me. And so um, totally. just finding the balance between that mentality when you're competing, but turning that off when you're not, I think a lot of guys, including myself, get caught up in that. Yeah. And I, and I think it's different for me as a female athlete and not having the status and even, even the financial, you know, benefits that you all had. So we kind of have to keep working and, and then, but then there's the difference for me because I know I hated that tryout process. I know I hated feeling like you're always having to try out. And for you guys between trades and going up and down and being brought down to, you know, triple a double a, whatever that looks like, that's hard to always feel like your job is on the line. And Shay talked about that. Like you're still an individual in this thing, but the reality is in team sports, it's the best team that wins. So that takes almost again, an extra special like mindset. Cause for us, once you're on the team, you're on the team. And once we got to that, then we could build it. But I, you guys really don't have that benefit to truly sit in that. And so, yeah, that would be really hard. Well, you shared so many great things. I, a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, you said compromise, you were use that word multiple times. And I agree. I think you start to compromise. And like you said, it's a slippery slope. And so knowing your values, knowing who you are and not being willing to compromise, I think is so important knowing like, again, what your goal is and what, what it's going to take to get there. Do you think compromise? And then you also mentioned accountability. Do those two things go together? Do you think people should find somebody or reach out or make sure they have accountability so they don't compromise? 1 million percent. Absolutely. Because what I tended to do, and I think uh, a lot of folks tend to do, I just had a phone call with someone who has been through a lot of the same things I have, a former major leaguer. And it's like, we just isolate. When we're in these battles in our mind, we just isolate. We don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want anyone to know we're struggling. And especially when you're put on a little bit of a pedestal, like you said, and it's like, I don't want to let everybody down. Well, you're only as sick as your secrets. And as soon as you speak about it and let it be out there and ask for help and accountability, it loses a little bit of that power. And you also realize, and I did, I wish I would have realized it sooner that, you know what, there's a lot of people that struggle just like you do, whether it be with your thought process, your mindset, your choices, you're not alone in this thing. And I think you, you feel like you are. And again, I think it's a tactic of the enemy. I really do. I always tell people I, the higher you're calling, the more he's going to get after you. You know, I always alluded to basketball. I'm like, think about it, buddy. If you're over there standing in the corner, gazing up at the crowd, and you can't shoot a lick, they're probably not going to put a guy on you. But if you're lighting it up, they're going to double team you. Their whole defense is going to be. So if you've got a high calling and you're out there doing good for God 
he's going to be relentless. And, um, you know, it's like, that's what I, I think. And so when you're, you know, whether you are, or you aren't, if you, especially if you start feeling like you're doing some good for God and you have a calling, that's when you start going, oh, yeah, I'm doing good things. This is great. And the devil's like, ah, and then you need other people to go, Hey, let's stay grounded here. And let's make sure this is going on and ask you hard questions and, and things like that. And so that's, that's, that's the people I'm most encouraged by are the ones who are very transparent. They come on and, and they, they do their thing and they admit their faults. And, and it's like, Oh gosh, me too. I, I can, I can relate to that. Um, because otherwise you just really do feel like, man, is everybody else this messed up as I am? I, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem like they are because everyone's acting like they have it going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so common. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, again, one other thing I just want to, as I wrap this up, you know, you talked about, you said I had a big need and then you were willing to ask. And I said that today to some students, I was saying, I said, ask lots of questions, ask people who can help you go and ask. And I said, that's what helped me because I wanted information. I want to receive it and not just receive it, but then apply it, use it, say yes to the opportunity. That's exactly what you did. You were able, some people are like, no, I don't want that because that's beneath me. And I'm no start there, start there. And then as opportunity opportunities open up, then take the next step. You know, just, you have to kind of take those steps. And I think that's what happens is more opportunities come when we say yes. And to the ones that are already there. And so thank you so much. Where can people find you? Yeah. On social so, media? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, brandonpuffer.com kind of lines all that out. Um, you know, I'm coach puff positive on Twitter without the E at the end of positive, um, really on all the social media systems. But if you go, just go to brandonpuffer.com, it's all on there. Okay. Thank you so much again, Brandon, for sharing your story today. Really, I think it's going to impact a lot of people in a positive way. Well, thank you, Leah. It's an honor. And I hope at least one person's encouraged. Uh, everyone, thanks again for listening to the Gold Standard Podcast. And we'll see you here next time. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Gold Standard Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with a friend. You can post on social media and tag at Leah20USA or use hashtag gold standard podcast. Make sure you also subscribe so you get notified each week as a new episode releases. You can subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We appreciate your reviews as they help encourage others to listen in. Until next time, live out the gold standard and keep turning your goals into reality.